Um, so I, I'm going to use this thing because I have a soft voice and it'll save it. Can you all hear me all right? Yeah. Okay. Uh, let me tell you what about this title and what I was hoping to do this afternoon. These um, all represent uh, projects or organizations, uh, things that I've become involved with over the past several years that I thought would be interesting to this group to hear something about. Um, some of what I say is some of you are going to know it already, but I think there's some things that are new here for everybody probably. Um, the last one I didn't include on the title because I could there's no acronym for it. Um, <laughs> But uh, this is something that's happened in the last three weeks, and, and I think it may be the most fun to discuss. So I'm hoping that, that this will be informative, uh, particularly for some of you who may not be familiar with how the National Academy and the NRC process works. Um, and uh, most of them are directly involved with Deber. Um, several of them are sort of life sciences oriented, but not all of them. And uh, some of them, I think, you may have questions about or, or you might have an interesting discussion, uh, particularly the last one. So um, this first one is uh, ST books, scientific teaching books. So this is something that everybody here ought to be interested in. This is a book that uh, was published about three weeks ago um, called Discipline-Based Education Research, a Scientist's Guide. And uh, the reason I'm showing it to you is because um, it's part of this uh, Freeman Scientific Teaching Series, which some of you may have seen. Um, I'm a co-editor of that with Sarah Miller at, at the University of Madison, uh, Wisconsin-Madison. And um, the first, uh, many of you might... Yeah. Um, yeah. Yes. Yeah. I'm taught in here. That's, That's better. better. I forgot that. <laughs> so uh, this one, You've pro many of you have uh, probably seen Scientific Teaching by Joe Handelsman and uh, two other people in, in Madison. Um, the second, that, that's been out for several years. The uh, second one is uh, Entering Research of Facilitator Manual. It's, it's about, it's a, a guide to help undergraduates who want to get started in a research lab and mentors who want to attract undergraduates to their labs, sort of how to go about it. Um, and the third one is uh, a collection of the essays by um, Kimberly Tanner and Deborah Allen, which have been appearing for the past uh, eight years or so in, in CB Life Sciences Education. And they provide a nice portal into education research for uh, neophytes. Um, and then this one has just come out. And all the others have been written by life scientists, so Sarah's and my job is to try to identify authors and recruit them and then help with the editing process. Um, and uh, all of them have been life science people so far until this one. And this is written by uh, Tim Slater, who some of you may know, at the uh, University of Wyoming. And uh, actually his wife, Stephanie Slater, is an educator there, and she's the lead author. And Janelle Bailey from uh, UNLV. And I'll just pass uh, these around. These are the oh, two of the only four copies in the state of Colorado, so uh, I want them back. But uh, you can take a look at it. And um, if you're in, and then we've got one in the works, which I think is, I think this one is, I think it's very good, and I'd love to get feedback from this group uh, to see what you think of it. Um, there's one coming. Uh, hopefully later this spring or summer, which will be about assessment, uh, <coughs> written by three people who are all um, involved with the Summer Institute, which I'll mention later, and, and CBE Life Sciences Education. So that's, uh, that's ST Books. That's the first one on the list. The second thing I wanted to mention is the AP Biology Revision. Do you mind if we interrupt you along the way? Or? Oh, absolutely. I should have, I meant to say that. Yeah, okay. yeah. Is there any reason why we can't get like a dozen of these books and share them around? I mean, I think this would be fabulous. Or if we have a, you know, three different courses now in discipline-based education research, it yeah. would really be great to have a bunch. Of, I was just trying to order it on Freeman, and of course it won't let me. But, um, it should be available now at the Freeman website, and Amazon has 
may not have listed it yet, but it will yeah. be shortly. Okay, well anyway, may, I'll work with you offline, but I think I think they'd be interested in our community for at least looking at you. Yeah. Um, at least along the way. Yeah. So they've been they've been handing these out for free at astronomy conferences. So I have the fifth copy of the state of Colorado. I noticed it's pitched for astronomy and biology um, on the Freeman website. So it asked me which biology or astronomy class I'm teaching. Um, oh, yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, anyway, well, I'll, I'll follow up separately, but maybe we make that a yeah. I stand or Deemer thing or something. Yeah, that's why you were able to order it. <laughs> and I have <laughs> copies of, books, of all the series. If anybody wants to look at them, they're in my office. So Great. I'd be happy to let them. Thanks, Steve. So, AP Biology, uh, as you may know, the new curriculum was released today, um, a few hours ago, finally. Um, and uh, I've been involved at several points along the way in the revision process that started back in the early 90s. No, not that long, sorry, late 90s or early 2000s. Um, so it's taken them about eight years, but they've come up with this new curriculum. Uh, others here have been involved, I know Mike's been involved uh, recently, and, uh, and I'm hesitant to spend too much time on this because it's not really deeper. Um, but uh, I wanted to just say a little bit about it, and I think you discussed it in here. Didn't you at one point? I don't think I was here for that, but uh, wasn't there a session about this? Well, uh, let me we just... Question about standards. Yeah. So I'm going to quickly flip this. So these are slides from the official presentation that they've put out now as a, as a uh, narrated PowerPoint. I'll spare you that. Uh, <laughs> But uh, I'm going to just flip quickly through these, and, and if you have any questions, stop and, and we can talk more about them. I think you've all heard about this and what they're trying to do. Uh, the main thing is, is to uh, try to get a more inquiry-based course and especially reduce the emphasis on com uh, broad content, uh, get away from trying to cover everything in biology and, and learn a whole bunch of facts and focus rather on, on uh, big ideas and depth of understanding of important concepts. So uh, these are the goals. Um, it's been, they've worked with uh, several different groups of, of people, teachers, and as well as uh, university people. Here's a few of them. Um, this just compares the, what's different about the courses. Um, this is the, the, the way they're structuring it. Uh, and uh, so they start with, they've built the whole thing around four big ideas, and then under that are what they're calling enduring understandings, which are sort of um, important concepts under the big ideas, and I'll show you examples in a minute. And then under those are essential knowledge, and uh, I know Mike had input sort of critiquing those and things that they thought were essential and uh, maybe weren't so essential. Um, and then there's an emphasis on science practices. And then finally they formulated the whole thing in terms of specific learning objectives. So it's a, it's a pretty complete curriculum that they've tried to make. And it's certainly not perfect, but I think it's a, it's a huge improvement over what they've had in the past. And it's going to be interesting to see how it, how it uh, is taught and how it goes over in schools. So here, the, here are the four big ideas. I won't even go through them. Uh, this is the way it's structured with enduring understandings under each one. Um, then under each enduring understanding, you have some essential pieces of knowledge. Um, and uh, then here are the science practices that, that they're trying to integrate all along with this. And they've done nice things like specifically exclude some things that are not going to be on the AP exam and that you should not memorize, like intermediates in the Krebs cycle of uh, oxidative and so forth. Um, and there's still, you know, I think Mike would agree that there's still too much detail in it, but they, they have eliminated quite a lot. They're, they've, they're publishing a guide to the most commonly used textbooks saying, you know, these are chapters you can omit uh, in the AP course. Wow. Um, and they're, uh, so they're trying to really cut back on the 
on the amount of factual detail that has to be presented in the course and give teachers a better understanding of what's actually going to be on the exam so that they can better structure the, the way they teach it. Um, they've developed new laboratories. If you look at the now column over there, they're supposed to be inquiry-based labs that are student-generated and uh, student-motivated. Um, I think a couple of those are out on the <coughs> website as, as examples, but uh, not the complete set. Um, the exam will have more free response questions uh, and fewer multiple choice questions. So it'll be about half free response. How, uh, how do they grade the free response things? Do they have fancy new software? Or is that something that's graded by individual teachers? Or? In the past, they've been graded by a panel of individual of teachers and university people. And I don't know how much they've, they've moved to uh, software. I'm not sure. It may say on the website. Which, you know, is they haven't in math. They haven't? No. We, have, we meet in the summer for a, a week long, like 10 hour days, and you do all these free response. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. There's some regret or what? Yeah. They will start allowing calculators in the exam, which they never had before, so that they can give students a data set and ask them to do something with it. Well, these are just examples of questions. I don't want to, I, I know you'll criticize these. So not even <laughs> you, don't leave it up long enough. Uh, really? Here's your one about uh, cladograms, and, and here's the question. So, there, you know, the multiple choice questions, too, are supposed to be designed to test higher Bloom's levels of understanding and make kids think about data and, and uh, things rather than simply spitting back uh, facts. Uh, and I think the two remaining big questions are still what's the whole exam actually going to look like, which nobody has seen yet, and this will be rolled out next year, I guess, next fall, I think, and, and people can start teaching it. Um, and then how are they going to do teacher professional development? Because this really involves a, not just a new course curriculum, but a whole new way of teaching compared to what a lot of teachers are now doing. So, uh, you know, they're going to have a summer, some kind of summer de development workshops um, and, uh, and then workshops throughout the year. Um, but it seems to me that's going to be a problem. Is yeah. It usually a spring course and it's in spring that this is going to be The exam is in the spring, I think. It's a year course. It's a year course, it's a year course one year course. Sure. I have two questions. Um, you keep saying that they are going to do this profession. Who is they again? Yeah. Well, it's the college board. I mean, this is all okay, it's done by the college board, okay. which is and a not-for-profit company. Uh, and these two awesome questions, whose questions are those? Is that the college board's questions? Are those the questions you left the committee with? The questions have been developed by a group that was a subset of those people. Yeah. These, questions. These, questions. these questions. These questions. These two questions that, that are that need to be asked. Oh. Is this Bill Wood asking these Is questions? Is this Bill Wood's question? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> yes. I, that I, makes a difference. <laughs> no, I'm sorry. Yeah, I, I mean, this yeah, they're, they're really important. They're so important. Yeah. And uh, I was just wondering, you know, how. Yeah. Who's going to answer those questions? <laughs> You can look at the website. So, so it came out today. If you want to take a look at this, the new bio the curriculum is uh, on that link. Wow! And uh, you know, I think they would say, uh, well, the exam is just like we've shown you the sample questions for. It. It's going to be concept based and um, key to the learning goals. Uh, <laughs> And they'd say, you know, we've got professional development. We got a plan for professional development for teachers, um, but it's a huge job, especially the professional development. Ongoing, huge job. Ongoing. 
and it's going to be harder for school systems that don't have a lot of resources, I think. Yeah. Do you have a feeling for how the goals of the AP are going to mesh with first year college biology courses? Committee in, in 2000, around 1999, that, that wrote the original critique, the NRC report that critiqued the AP program. And, and it seemed to us, writing this critique, that one of the real potentials here was that a good revision to the AP biology could drive change at the university level in the introductory courses. Because if student, if this really works, and, and I'm sure it will in, in some places anyway. Uh, I don't think those students are going to put up with the kind of freshman biology that's often taught at the university. Yeah, AP students test out of freshman level biology, so this is supposed to be the same level as freshman level biology. Well, uh, that's true. Well, but even the, you know, even the sophomore biology, I think, for those most courses, the pedagogy is, is not up to the standard, their hope for standard. Um, so anyway, I, I mean, I thought your comments, your criticisms were right on, on almost all of them, saying, you know, no, you don't need to cover this, you don't need to know this. Um, so I think the curriculum is fairly complete. Uh, it's just a question of how much detail they're going to go into on the, in the model. Can you comment what way, what do you think the background thing is? physics to do it, or is it, can you really do a standalone? So I don't really have a good feeling for what a person's going into. I don't remember those high school years anymore. I mean, what the College Board has said is that this should not be the first science course that students take in high school. And it shouldn't even be the first biology course. So they're trying to require schools to give a pre-AP biology, and they've developed a set of standards, which I think you've seen, called standards for college level study of biology or something like that, which are supposed to be met before you get into this course. Um, and that's another thing that many schools won't be prepared to do without some, some work. AP chemistry is uh, undergoing a transformation. I yeah. think there are about one to two years, I don't know if you know, the rollout for AP chemistry, chemistry and is and one to two uh, years from now under development, yeah. And I assume we'll have similar kinds of changes incorporated in them. Any other AP questions? Check the website. Uh, if you want to know more, I think there's a lot of information on the website. And they've put out a lot of material to introduce teachers to it to try to help them not be scared about what's going to happen and uh, how to deal with it. Uh, which is up there too. All right, the, the next thing I wanted to talk about is the, these two things together, which are uh, two NRC projects. And um, I'll say a little bit about how that whole process works for those of you who aren't familiar with it. Um, so bear with me if you are. Um, this is a consensus committee that I'm now serving on. Uh, I'll explain what that is in a minute, with this title. And it's sponsored by the National Academy's Board on Science Education, BOSE, um, which many of you are, have heard of, I'm sure. Carl Wyman was the chair of it uh, for several years. That's the acronym. Um, <laughs> oh. <laughs> yeah, if, you, if you try to Google it, you get new folks. But, uh, it's down there on the list. Um, and uh, so, so let me say a little bit first about Bose. Uh, here's their website. Uh, the URL is up here if you wanted to take a look at it. Um, it's a group of people put together by the, uh, the National Research Council, which is the action arm of the National Academy. 
Um, and never mind the structure up here if you don't, if you're not interested. But down below, what, what BOSE is supposed to do is provide advice on the research and best practices for science education at all levels in school and non school settings. And the principal way they do this, so it's a group of people with expertise in a number of different disciplines, including educators and, uh, and a couple of business people and uh, various disciplines. And um, the main way that they operate is to commission these reports from the National Research Council. So these people sit around, and I'm also on the Bose committee at the moment until May, and I think I rotate off. Uh, so we sit around and talk about what ought to be investigated or where it is, is there some place where there's enough of an evidence base so that it would be useful to have a study that really pulled it together and drew some conclusions from it. Um, and uh, these are called consensus reports because what they do then is appoint a committee of all the volunteers to uh, come and meet uh, several times a year usually uh, for a year or two and then come up with a consensus report, which all of them have to agree to. Every once in a while there's a dissenting opinion from one of these, but usually they manage to, they get a very diverse group of individuals together often who argue a lot and often can't talk to each other for the first few meetings because they don't know each other's jargon, uh, like educators and scientists, for example. Um, but in the end they have to reach, they try to reach consensus on a, on a report that then gets published. And I'm sure you're familiar with many of these. Um, this, uh, so here's a few of them that have, that have had a considerable impact, I think. In the past, these reports tended to be pretty dry and scholarly and sat on shelves a lot, I think. And now they've started uh, really, I think under Carl's, I think this was Carl's idea, to start publishing not only the report, but a companion volume, a practitioner volume, which would be much more accessible to people actually in the field who might use this information. So this uh, Taking Science to School was the report, Ready, Set, Science is the, is the practitioner volume, um, this Learning Science in Informal Environments was a report surrounded by science is the practitioner volume for science and informal environments. So I think they're having an impact. And two very recent ones are, uh, this one just came out recently, it's a review of NOAA's education program. And then this one will be interesting, um, Learning Science Through Computer Games and Simulations. That's actually finished, it's on the website and you can access it as PDF files. Um, and it'll be published as a book sometime soon. Um, and then the a big one they're working on now is this framework for uh, national science standards, which we've talked about in here. And you remember we sent a response to their draft that they, uh, some of us sent a response to their draft that they put out last fall sometime, I think it was, and gave only two weeks for people to react to it. Um, we were quick. We were quick, and, and I don't know if they listened to us or not, because these, so this is an NRC committee, the NRC committee people are not allowed to talk about what's, what the actual conclusions are until the report is released. So what I'm going to tell you today is just sort of what the committee is trying to do rather than any of the real results. Yeah. Um, so this, I mean, even, they wouldn't even tell the Bose committee what was happening, you know, whether they took our advice, the people who responded. So I don't really know what's going on with that, <coughs> but it should be out sometime pretty soon. Um, just to, okay, so that's the, it, yeah. Just to comment on the framework for uh, this community. So um, this is the report, when that comes out of the, the national frameworks comes out, it's going to be handed over to Achieve, which is this national not-for-profit that's going to turn that into national standards and possibly associated kinds of test questions. Steve Pruitt's the vice president there. Um, he's willing to, uh, well, both come out here and run a video Skype with us in advance of that to get feedback from this community about the frameworks, both before the frameworks are out and after the frameworks are out, if we want to follow up as an actual next step. I think that would be a reasonable thing for this particular community. Um, we haven't, we don't have a date for them yet, but I think we can make it both before and after. We were waiting to hear more about the frameworks, but I gather it's not known when they're coming out. Anyway, so 
So the point is, is this is going to turn into something that will be the update for you know the national standards um, that are considered you know 15 years out of date, not that we've enacted them. Um, and and so this is an opportunity to see how that uh, those frameworks are made, and we can then contribute to the standards that come from that. So Phil, did you say you had an idea when these were coming out? Well, it's supposed to be later this spring. Okay. Yeah. Spring. The latest I heard was that they're on being postponed. It was supposed to be winter, then it was postponed, I think, yeah. in spring and maybe summer. I, I just don't know. They, they did it on an extremely short time scale. Uh, I don't remember exactly why. I think there were funding considerations and also they, um, they wanted to get something done before other people preempted this. And, uh, so they've been on an unusually fast time scale and they've been scrambling, I think, to get it. So um, a couple of years ago, they, the Bose Committee decided it would be worthwhile to do a study of discipline-based education research uh, and pull it together. And so they started by, uh, there were two workshops in, the, in 2008. Were any of you at those workshops? Noah, did you, were you at one of those? Charles Henderson was. Right. The ER. Okay. Uh, Anyway, this was... Melissa was here now also. It, it um, brought together, for the first time, I think, deeper people from all the different disciplines who normally hadn't talked to each other much, uh, to sort of look at what are the promising practices based on the evidence that we have now in the various fields of, of deeper. Um, and out of this, came, so it was, a, it was two one-day workshops. Out of it came a set of commissioned papers, which are, some of them are quite good, especially uh, there's one by Jeffrey Freud, which I, I like a lot, um, which was sort of a summary of the promise, of promising practices in the different fields and how implementable they are. Uh, Nancy and Henderson were both there and, and, uh, and also contributed a nice paper, which is on the website, which says, a lot of the things that they have said in there and other publications. Uh, it's a good summary. And then Jim Fairweather uh, gave sort of the summary of talk and, and wrote a paper summarizing the whole thing, emphasizing the Nancy Henderson line that, that it's all very nice to have this evidence for what works, but the real elephant in the room is, is implementation. How are you going to get people to actually change the way they teach and start using some of this information? So those were the, uh, that was the background. And then, um, so Bose made a proposal that in order to do these things, you have to get funding. And so often the funding comes from NSF, but sometimes not. Uh, one of these reports was funded by a Merck company um, and so on. So they, they look around for funders who would be interested in funding these things. And so the proposal that Bose made to the NSF was that they should investigate these five principal questions relating to deeper. And I, I won't read them to you, you can read them. Um, and NSF uh, funded this uh, a year ago. And so they appointed a committee. And uh, at this point, then the funder gets to have input on what the committee is actually going to do. So the funder sits down with the chair of the committee and comes up with a study charge, which is a specific set of things, which hopefully reflects what, what was proposed, and it does pretty much. So I'll just show you that these are, this is the study charge. Um, basically trying to find out what's going on in each of the various disciplines, uh, how well do they interrelate, and um, how different are they? How is the research being done? What is the extent of the knowledge base? And then there's uh, four more, uh, including this one, number eight again, which is, is uh, how do you get this to actually get implemented and used? So um, here are the members uh, of the committee. It's chaired by Susan Singer, who some of you know. Uh, and it has, as you see, biologists, chemists, geologists, physicists, uh, a couple of uh, educators, 
uh, Tim Slater, the, uh, one of the authors of the book, um, is uh, um, an astronomer, but he's technically an educator uh, in, at Wyoming, and then an engineer, Carl Smith, and a cognitive psychologist. It's a good committee, I think. No mathematicians. No, they decided not to include math. I mean, they had a big argument about this, you know, <coughs> they or not, and they decided the scope would be too big and that it was different enough from the other science disciplines that they, they didn't try to include. So math is not included, unfortunately. They have all disciplines, science and engineering. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so there have been three meetings so far. There are going to be five all together, so there's two more to go. Uh, we've interpreted the study charge and planned how, what to do, tried to link it and build on the promising practices papers, uh, and then we've commissioned papers um, on the history and current status of the discipline for this alphabet soup of, of ERs. Um, and uh, we've had then a couple of, also a couple of invited speakers, and I thought you might be interested to know where we're getting our information, so who these people are. Um, so you can pick out your favorite discipline and see who, the, who wrote these papers. And this is now all public record information, so I can tell you about it. And these, the pa these white papers, as they call them, um, will be posted on the website long before the consensus report is done, so sometime later this spring. Are they draft papers 125 pages? Yeah. Currently. The what? The Jose status, Jose oh, it's yeah. doctor's paper. Yeah, it was almost embarrassing. I mean, Jose <laughs> turned in this, well, Jennifer Doctor, I think, wrote most of it. Yeah. But uh, anyway, they, it was that thick. Uh, and ours was, you know, were, the others were all small. We didn't but, have anything to say. We just kept well, up. one doesn't know, right? Right. Oh, they did a, I mean, it's a beautiful it's paper. Nice. Summer. They really covered everything. <laughs> <laughs> um, any comments about any of the other people here? I thought probably some of you know some of these people. I've seen George Boder talk about this, and I don't know. My guess would be it's all very produce centric. Say that again. Very produce centric. In what was that? Yeah, all of the chemistry education. That's right. the way the report looks. But even so. I'm just guessing. I, uh, <laughs> <laughs> I, 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 I have also heard Bonner talk, and I think well, they're sort of yeah, the Bonner didn't board actually talk. He, uh, okay. he, he wrote the paper, and then Stacy Bretz presented it. And, um, she's also. She's also pretty good. <laughs> uh, but anyway, she didn't quite agree with everything he said, so she gave sort of a little mini. <laughs> <laughs> They're not public yet, but they will be in a month or so. I think we've just gotten the final drafts. So and they're going to be great resources. I mean, they're, they're just in their own right. They're really useful. But to be fair, if you wanted someone to write about the history of chemistry education research you Purdue is going to be play a major role because yeah. that's pretty much where it started. Right. It does play a major role. Yeah. It's not this old. It's not this old. It's, yeah. <laughs> it happens that way. <laughs> well, that, I mean, Melanie is also on the committee. You what? Melanie is also on the committee, and I think she's pretty interesting. Yes. Uh, right. I mean, these are commissioned papers that don't go into the report, but rather uh, inform the report and are considered resources along the way. So uh, just to emphasize, there's no way to be comprehensive and complete here, but this is the first attempt to span um, the disciplines in this way and document the history in sort of a formal uh, mechanism. It's, it's really tremendous. Uh, we also, at the last meeting, we had some non-science or non natural science speakers, um, cognitive from cognitive people. Um, those were good, especially Rich Mayer's talk was very good, I thought. Um, so those will help 
inform the committee also. And what we need to do now are start pulling this together, agree on what are going to what we're going to say are standards of evidence, uh, try to synthesize what is known in each discipline and how it relates to the others, and then write this thing. Wow. Um, and the writing is actually done. The staff of these committee, the staff of the goes and the committees are spectacular people, really very talented people, good writers, and so the they committee. Write it. Hmm? They write it? No, the committee writes drafts, but the committee writes chunks of it, and then they sort of pull it all together and give it a common style and so on. And, uh, but they are very smart people, and they will contribute a lot to the writing, not just editing. Wow. So it's a fair amount of work, but, but you know, the committee will do all the work. And uh, the final report should be out late fall or winter uh, next year. That's the website if you want to follow this process. Um, you can go there. There's another meeting. There are two more meetings coming up. There's one coming up this month, and then the last one will be this summer. March. March, right. Yeah, you're going to be yeah, here. So yeah, I'm going to represent the SDI. Yes. My understanding, I don't know, I'm talking about the details, but my understanding about well, the next one is, at least from the SDI perspective, is about um, possible, you know, mechanisms for training people like that. Exactly. And, uh, it's this big, the elephant in the room, I like to call it, you know, the implementation, how are you going to make some of these things happen? <clears throat> and so I think they're looking for examples of programs that are successfully implementing some of these research-based changes. They also talk about training, like new, new faculty and like where the source of people going into the research. So I'm, I, I'm not totally clear on that. Well, that may be included, too. I haven't seen the agenda of the March. It was just hinted at. Yeah. Um, all right, Saber, this is mostly for the biologists here. Um, biology education research, it was interesting, that history report, I mean, it goes way back. People started writing about it back in the, before the turn of the last century. Um, but uh, Clarissa pulled together a set of, she did an extensive search and found, I think, 190 publications that dealt with post-secondary uh, biology education research, uh, teaching at the post-secondary level. Uh, they were published between 1990 and 2010, and 83% uh, of them were published since 2001. So, uh, and I have to say that a third of those were published in CBD Life Sciences Education, which is obviously filling a niche out there. Um, so biology education is a young, rapidly growing field. Um, and it's never had a society before. And so this society was formed last September. Here's the website. Uh, here's their mission statement. Um, and it was put together, it was created by a group of 40, uh, 30 people who uh, were convened in uh, in Minnesota by uh, three people. Here's the <coughs> here's the founding members. Um, you see a few familiar faces up there. Michelle Smith and Jenny and I were all there. Um, and uh, they come from all over. We had the meeting in the most spectacular uh, scale of classroom I've ever seen. Uh, and this is a crummy iPhone photo of it, but uh, you can sort of see, it's pretty dark too, you can't really see. The, the difference to this room is that it's very spacious, it's much higher, there are monitors all around, so and, and every table can be set up to present to the whole class. Uh, <coughs> and, and
and this is in a building which houses 10 of these classrooms. They actually managed wow. to build an entire teaching building full of these classrooms. <coughs> uh, this is the biggest size. I think this holds 144 people, and they have some that are smaller wow. as well, but they're just beautifully set up. So that was fun, just being in that classroom and seeing what can be done. Um, so if you're interested, sign up. Uh, we, ne we have a website as of a couple of weeks ago uh, at this URL. Uh, the first annual meeting is already planned for next summer, which will be held in the same, yeah, probably that same room. And uh, I think it's 50 bucks membership fee at this point. So uh, sign up. If you're Organization that's being sponsored by a bigger organization, or you know, like, is it did they get some initial funding? How did it start? Just somebody decided to work on the Uh, yeah, Mary Pat Munderoff at Seattle and Florida Service got together and decided this should happen, and uh, they got Robin Wright to Minnesota to get involved. And the space and uh, they must have had some additional funding because I think they didn't pay on travel. So I don't remember where they got that, but it wasn't much. Uh, I think they did. I think they had a small grant. Yeah, yeah. I think it was an NSF grant. But it was a wonderful meeting. It was a very enthusiastic group and, and a lot got done in two days. Uh, and now we exist. So uh, quickly, the RSIs, this is, stands for Regional Summer Institute. Um, many of you have heard of the Summer Institutes in Biology for undergraduate biology education that are funded by primarily HHMI and have been going on for the last seven years. Um, they were launched in response to the um, Bio 2010 report, which recommended doing this kind of thing for setting up some kind of professional development um, in the life sciences. Um, the initial idea was described in this article in Science back uh, several years ago, and then this uh, recent article was a review of what's been going on for the last several years in terms of how many people we've reached and so on. But it's uh, this is the website. Um, it's a one-week professional development workshop for biology faculty. Um, we try to get teams of people from mostly research one universities. Usually a junior person and a senior person or an administrator. Uh, and they get a saturation intensive uh, week of hands-on um, pedagogy, basically. And uh, it's a lot of fun and a lot of, they work very hard. And we've now reached, uh, I think we've had about 300 participants from 100 different institutions. We've, we've got most of the R1 institutions in the country uh, by now. So um, uh, how does that work? That, that uh, you, Do you send out announcements to the chairs of, of <coughs> biology departments all over the nation? Yeah. Really like cool. the new people come in all the time, I would guess. And then is it by invitation only, or is it just anybody can sign up? Well, we can handle about 20 teams each year, and uh, and so far we've always been oversubscribed. We had to be competitive and accept only a certain group. But we have taken repeat, so we've tried to also get repeat participation. So I think we've sent three teams from Boulder over the past uh, seven years, and uh, so that we build a critical mass of people uh, at uh, different places. Um, and, then, and the news, the reason I'm talking about this is that we've recently gotten funding to expand the whole thing and start a set of regional institutes beginning this year. Um, and uh, there are going to be four new sites in uh, this year, one of them this year. Jenny Knight's going to be running that, and I will help with that. Um, and in the following uh, 
following year we'll probably get at least three more. Um, and the goal is that maybe as, as many as 10 additional, or 10 uh, regional institutes modeled pretty much around the, the original plan. Uh, Joe Handelsman is the, is the director of the whole thing, and I've been co-director uh, for the past seven, since we started it. Um, okay, so we've got a few minutes left to, to uh, talk about, or any questions about the Summer Institute before I, uh, yeah. So uh, this, I think it's tremendously important, in fact, um, to talk about this issue of translating deeper into action yeah. Um, in the classroom, it strikes me that this is a critical piece that's uh, integrated. Um, Henderson and Tansy have studied the new faculty workshops in physics and found that to be second highest correlate to implementing education research based reforms in, your, mm -hmm. in the physics classrooms. Um, so it strikes me as really important. Have you looked at sort of relative merits of these two different models for the, the physics, which brings everybody to one central location twice yeah. a year in uh, DC? sponsored by professional societies rather than sort of disparate located around. No, we haven't. I mean, that would be a really nice study for somebody to do it. <laughs> but we don't, we haven't even got the kind of data that you have. I mean, we're just starting now to try to collect, as you, as you know, it's very hard to get outcomes data. You know, how, how much of an impact did you actually have on these people? Right. Uh, we've got some based, it's all based on self-reporting. And then Diane Ebert May and her people tried to do a study that uh, actually got people to videotape their classes and then did RCOP analysis on the, on the classes. And I think it was flawed in some ways, and it didn't show that much change. It was kind of disappointing. But I think it was part of the way she did it. Uh, well, and the RCOP itself, and there, there could be a temporal lag. I mean, simply implementing something exactly. is a huge step Exactly. Above uh, or being aware of something is a huge step. Implementing is another huge step. Being effective at it, well, that's you know crazy. But um, I think that's a major flaw. I mean, many of the people we've talked to said you know it took me three or four years before I really got this to work. Sure. And she did her study a year after people had, or within two years of when people had finished the program. And I think many of them just weren't yeah. there. No, my clickers are still breaking. So. <laughs> yeah. So we're, one of the things we had to do to, to uh, get this funding is to promise to do more evaluation and better evaluation. Well, at least for the local one, and I don't know, maybe if you're involved in the sort of larger um, scale, definitely since Melissa Dancy's now here, great to bring her in on the design of both, you know, what's known, what, what are the easy things to steal from the AIP, AAPT, yeah. APS yeah. physics side, and what are the instruments that they're using to evaluate Yes. And plus, we could also bring Henderson out any time we want to. So. so Melissa is here? Yeah, Melissa's moved. She's joined the faculty um, now in the physics department. Right now, she's visiting, but we're looking to uh, uh, have her join us and attend it. We have to bring that in through faculty vote. But she's moved. Yeah, oh, how about wonderful. that? Yeah. She would be here today, except that schools yeah. are off. She's got kids. Yeah. <laughs> All right, so let me just say a little bit about this project, which might be the most interesting for the group to discuss. So this is just an idea. That's all it is so far. And it was started about, uh, and it came from Peter Bruns at HHMI. Who, he's the guy who used to be director of the whole education operation at HHMI. Um, and he's now stepped down and Sean Carroll has taken over, but Peter is still working with them as a special consultant. Um, so this came out of discussions for many, several years that have been going on among biology people that it would be really nice to have some kind of a repository of teaching materials on the web that so you could go and find good Twitter questions or good assessments or uh, classroom activities and so on. Um, and nobody's been able to put this together. It turned, it, I tried. At the AS, at the um, biology, the Cell Biology Society, and it really takes a major effort to get people to submit things and, all, and then to curate them uh, so that it, we end up with something good. Uh, and then this came uh, to.
to a head at this Vision and Change conference that happened uh, a year and a half ago that some of you know about. The report on this is a summary report that came out last uh, fall, I think, and then the, the whole report is coming out in a few months. Um, but people there agreed that some kind of a repository of teaching materials would be wonderful. Uh, and Peter sort of took it on himself to start working on this with HHMI's blessing, I think. Um, so uh, Peter wrote a sort of prospectus, which he wants to go and try to talk to funding agencies about. And then he ran it by a group of people, um, uh, myself and, and, a, and about five other people, um, who've been involved in the Cell Biology Education Journal and so on. Um, and I got this thing uh, the day after um, we had heard this uh, this fascinating talk by Ed Johnson mm -hmm. two weeks ago. And so I, I immediately got Peter in touch with Ed and sent Peter the website the, and the stuff that Ed presented here because it seemed to me this was a, a natural kind of synergy. So Ed's been part of this group now too. It's been bouncing this thing back and forth. So we added ideas and went back and forth with Peter on it. Uh, and uh, what I'm showing you here is, is excerpts from the final draft that Peter put together. Um, and uh, it will try to get funding for it. So this is the vision. Um, Peter wanted, was thinking of it as a list of courses, uh, basically like a university catalog where you could go and look for cell biology and then you'd find uh, materials for, a, for the ideal cell biology course. Um, the thing that excited me and that Ed was contributing to uh, primarily was this idea of a, what's it called, an ontological database uh, that uh, you know, would let you get into the content through uh, kind of a whole curriculum set up like the AP biology thing or, uh, with links to classroom materials and assessments and so on. Um, and, and Peter's final draft here says we'll, we'll try to do both and link them together. Um, the idea would be that you'd have different levels of things. So you'd have plug and play courses that uh, people could simply adopt pretty much as is. Or you'd have course components or raw materials uh, that you could use to build a new course. And um, biologists will realize this is a play on PubMed, which is the database for biology research literature. Um, There would, this would be editorially reviewed, so the idea would be to look for not only appropriate content, but good pedagogical design. So I think they would only take a whole course if it was really well designed pedagogically and included good assessments and classroom activities and so on. Um, it's not clear to me quite what the, where the content would come from in this. He says here that uh, you, you won't try to duplicate or eliminate textbooks. Um, but uh, he told somebody that was just being diplomatic. <laughs> so I don't know what he really envisioned. I think it would be a mistake to try to write a new textbook in sight, but I'm not sure that's what he thinks. Okay. Now, is this for all the students? Or this is so far just for biology, but I think the model I mean, what I'd like to discuss, it would be fun to discuss, I think, is how, is this a good idea? Would it work for life sciences and for other disciplines? So let me just show you a little more of the idea here. Um, so these are the kind of components that would be included. It would be some kind of, uh, I think this was Ed's uh, edition, some kind of social networking mechanism so that you could have people uh, recommending things or rating them. Um, it would be set up like a journal with an editor and an editorial board and 
uh, in such a way that people could actually get academic credit for contributing to it. And this is his idea of what it would take to get it started, or get it going. So the questions, I think, are, you know, is this a good idea? And, and could it work? <coughs> How much demand do you think there would be for something like this? Um, back to the previous slide. I particularly like the, the, and I hope that you'd be able to stick with that kind of course format, you know, teaching format. I, th I like that narrowing of the focus. Like we have the PER central, it's like mm -hmm. everything, uh, PER. Uh, and so I, 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 I would love to see something that's so practical like this, you know what I mean? Um, I like the course focus. Like the, the focus on focus courses. On courses. Yeah. On I teaching think, and I mean, on courses. I think there would be a lot of people who would just love to take a ready-to-go cell biology course and try to teach it. I think there would be other people who want a, a really good clicker question on, Absolutely. you know, could follow the knowledge tree and go out and find some node on the tree and, and find a good assessment question. So, um, Bill, just so you know, the SEI with Sarah Gilbert of our community has been leading the development of something with a lot of similar goals up there in terms of making goals for our I think it, you know, it, it, um, it's not as fast as we need to navigate as we might want it to be, but it, but it does have one of those same goals, and we might yeah. want to look at it to see what does work and what doesn't work with it. So it yeah. you know, and talk to her about the challenges. Okay. There's several of how to work. sort of like this or related things. I think it needs to be really central and like, you know, right now that's just like for this one project we want to do. Like we're really to be used a lot of things have there needs to be a critical mass and stuff that's there. Yeah. That's gotta be curated. Nice that people got credit for it has to be fast. contributing to it. Yeah. Like me. Yeah. <laughs> no. Very easy. I've already done. So um, I think it's a great idea. And I think that it's in a long time in the coming. I think it's totally necessary. I think the technology exists for us to do this in really powerful ways. The, the cultural and social will is a whole nother story, which, I mean, part of your other talk was about the national frameworks and standards. How that all fits in, let alone with the publishing, is another um, grand challenge. And the question is whether or not, and I think the a right thing here would be uh, to follow up on some work that was sponsored by the National Academies of Future. The textbook was a sort of national workshop that a lot of really neat ideas came out of and might be worth sort of revisiting some of that. 